Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. The first thing that we're looking to do is obviously align the golf club to the target point. We're looking for the club face to be square to the target, both the setup and the strike position. You know, the second fundamental we like to see is to develop a path where the club face is square to the path. So at the moment of impact, for the club to be running down the target line. I mean, in, in reality, the putting stroke will have a slight arc to that stroke, but through impact, we're looking for the club to be running down the target line and club face square to the path. Now, to help achieve those fundamentals, we want to talk about a neutral setup position. You know, we want you know, our eyes in an optimum position, which is going to run down the ball to target line, running parallel to that line, and the alignment of the upper body to be neutral as well, because that can influence the path of the stroke. So when we talk about neutral, we're talking about neutral body parts, parallel alignment, good eye positioning, those type of aspects. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. David Largent, a longtime listener who's also in the golf industry back in Hong Kong, requested that I talk to Philip Kenyon, Director of Instruction for the Harold Swash School of Putting Excellence in Merseydale, England. If you're familiar with Yes Putters, then you've heard of their inventor, Harold Swash, and his Sea Groove Technologies. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Phil. Hi, Fred. You well? I'm well, and you're well. This is, I, I, Skype is so amazing. Tell me where you are. I'm... Um, I'm at home, which and home for me is um, Southport, which is in the northwest of England, about um, twenty miles north of Liverpool. I don't know if you. I have you not know been. I have not been, but I, I want to congratulate you for being the very first person uh, on Golf Smarter that is calling from that side of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's incredible. So let's talk about the Harold Swash Putting School of Excellence. You are. Uh, the director of instruction there. Yeah, that's right. For my sins. <laughs> T- tell me about the school and and what the focus of the school is. Well, well, basically, we we have a an indoor indoor studio which is based in, in Southport, and uh, we just provide you know putting specific instruction and fitting. Um, Harold himself uh, has been involved in the industry as a kind of putting coach and designer of putting training aids and putters for over 40 years so it's just evolved over the years and um about eight years ago we set up our first um indoor facility uh, of our own so to speak so um yeah we welcome all comers whether you're a kind of a seasoned golfer or new to the game or at all professional if we can help you then we'll do our best and why the decision to just focus on putting only at your school I think it's, I mean, like I say, Harold, um, 40 years back, through his uh, engineering background, um, really started to look at putter design and uh, through getting involved in various projects, um, started to understand a lot more about putting technique and through his his, um, access to tour players, developed his philosophy and really was ahead of his time really when when you think even now these days you know putting instruction is very much um undervalued um so we feel that there's a little bit of a it's a bit of a niche market um i don't know what it's like in america but i think in the uk a lot of pj professionals tend to shy away from putting instruction but yet, for, for most golfers, it's the one area of the of the game that they can improve and the, the one route where they can cut you know, shots off their handicap quite quickly. That is the place where, you, if you're going to score well, I mean, this whole idea of, of driving the ball longer is more ego thing, I would think, than anything else. And that, that if yeah. you really want to lower your scores, uh, you've got to do it from 100 yards and in, right? And, and even more specifically, on the green itself. Drive for show, put for dough, wasn't it? Was it who was who said that? Was it Sam Snead or somebody? No, that was me. Yeah, 
That was. Nice. <laughs> I think okay. I've said it two or three times because I don't show very well. Um, so, what is your background, and how did you meet up with Harold? Okay, um, I've known Harold ever since I was in short trousers. Really, um, he's a very he's a very good family friend, a friend of my father's and mother's, and so really, when I first got introduced to the game, Harold was there to, to help me. Um, so he kind of watched my development as a as a as a golfer and also as a you know as a teenager and uh, we spent a lot of time together. So I got a, an insight into Harold's work and what he did and and uh, obviously with my interest in golf it was you know fascinating for me. And then um, you know I went on to university and and uh, to play professional golf for a while and during that time you know I got grew closer to Harold and would get more involved and then. Um, when it came time to kind of hang up my my playing boots, I got more uh, more closely involved with Harold and, and focused on that from a, a full time point of view, which has really taken up the last six years of my life. You know, working quite closely with Harold, building up the school and, and what we do. Mm-hmm. And do you work with a- amateurs and professionals? Yeah, like I mentioned before, all comers really. We um, we get a wide range of golfers that come through the studio, whether it's for instruction or uh, for putter fitting. And um, obviously, uh, there are a few guys out on tour that we work with, so golfers of all abilities, really. Are you able to share some names of some of the people that you work with, or, or you specifically, and who come through the school that we may have oh. heard of? Sure, yeah. Um, okay, one of our students that's been doing really well of late is um, a Swedish golfer called Henrik Stenson. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we have uh, been doing some work recently with Martin Kamer from Germany, who's a really you know, promising player who's made great inroads over the last couple of years. Um, on the European tour, uh, guys like um, Oli Fischer. He's a very young young golf. I think he was one of the youngest golfers to get his European tour card. Um, Ollie Wilson, who's a Ryder Cup player, uh, played in America in the last Ryder Cup. Um, Mark Foster, Martin Lefebvre, and, and, and numerous other guys on the European tour, which some of your viewers may have heard of if they if they watch the Golf Channel. Yeah, yeah. There's also uh, on your website, there's a testimonial from a very high profile player, the website being heraldswashputting.co.uk, and we'll give uh, people more information about that on, on our blog um, and links to it. Um, so a very, very high profile uh, PGA Tour player who does a yeah. nice testimonial. You want to talk about that, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't mention Padraig there because he's, he's not someone that I've actually done any work with myself. But um, I mean, Har- Harold, Harold's resume would be on here for an hour, just going through Harold's resume. He's worked with some of the best players in the world, and I think uh, I think one of them, which Harold really feels quite proud about, is, is Padraig Harrington. Harold's uh, done a lot of work over the years uh, with Padraig. Um, they don't. To spend too much time together these days, but he's been very influential in Padraig's career, particularly in the early stages of, of his career. And it was great for, for Padraig to give us a testimonial for our website. And mm-hmm. uh, I think if anybody deserves anything out of the game, from what Harold tells me, um, it's Padraig in, in his approach, you know, to, to not leaving any stone unturned, you know, to make himself a better golfer and not just a better putter. So. Mm. Fabulous. Well, congratulations. Um, one of the other things that kind of jumped out at me uh, about um, Harold on the website is they called him the Miracle Man of Augusta. What, yeah. what does that mean? Because <laughs> we all, we all, if we've ever watched uh, the Masters before, we know the speed of the greens at Augusta. What, what did uh, Harold have to do with that? Well, Harold has had suffered from some ill, Ill health over the years. Um, he's uh, had, had a heart bypass many years ago. And um, I'm just trying to think of the year now, but quite a few years back at Augusta, when he was on the putting green, he, he suffered from a, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, oh my God. which um, he was very lucky to survive from, because I believe it's a very small so like percentage survival rate but luckily for Harold um, by the side of the green at Augusta was a, a surgeon who was a specialist in this area who um, identified his symptoms they rushed him into hospital 
and luckily I believe that um, the the um, operating theatre was set up for a similar type of operation, which again saved time. Harold was rushed into surgery, and uh, after quite a lengthy operation, made a full recovery. So uh, the the nurses at the uh, hospital uh, in Augusta uh, called him the Miracle Man. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with the, what he's taught people on how to buy it. It's just the fact that he's a survivor. And, ha- well, and you could say oh, that about Harold. He's definitely a survivor, yeah. And we're yeah. grateful for it. And I'm sure you yeah. are too. I'm sure definitely, are too. yeah. yeah. Um, he's, if he was a cat, I think he'd be on his last life now. He's oh. only used about eight of them. Gosh, I hope not. I, I hope that there's a lot more years to come. Well, let's talk about putting a little bit here. Um, I want to get into some putting fundamentals with you. And uh, we also, um, before we're done here today, I want to talk about uh, Harold's design in putters and um, what what kind of impact he's had in the line of putters that he's had a high influence on. But I want to talk about putting fundamentals. I want to see what you can do to help me and us um, on, on this. And let's start with... The idea that some, you know, some uh, schools that we've talked to said that they break you down from the the bottom up and then uh, start you all over, and then there are other schools who want to uh, focus on what you have and and um, work with that. Um, there are so many different types of grips that people put on putters. Um, is there one that the Harold Swash School of a uh, Putting School of Excellence uh, uh, kind of uh, wants everybody to do, or do you allow people to come in and say, "This is how I putt. Help me be a better putter." How does it work for you guys? Yeah, I think uh, there are obviously, you know, everybody's different. Uh, everybody has individual characteristics which you need to take into account. Um, but there, there are some, you know, simple fundamentals which we 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 like all our students to try and, you know, adopt, um, which are based on you know scientific principles. Um, but at the same time, you have to be adaptable and flexible to to the individual that you have you you have in front of you. You're trying to make that individual put better. Um, so it's a combination of both, really, to skirt around that question, Fred. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, sincerely, I think it is a combination of both. Um, you've got to work with a student you've got in front of you, and you've got to make sure what they have is is an accurate and, and efficient you know, uh, technique. What do you see as the biggest problem that most people um, bring to their putting game? I mean, I know, I know on, a, on your, your swing, you know, there's the position, grip, and alignment. Does that also fall into to line in putting as well? Yeah, I think so. I think setup is uh, of utmost importance, you know, in the putting stroke. Uh, I, th- I see, you know, um, 90% of faults just stemming from setup, really. And so from having a, you know, if we can get a student into a neutral setup position, they've got a chance of developing a, you know, quite a neutral stroke. But uh, from a poor setup position, you know, you've not got a lot of time or room to make uh, compensation. Um, so poor setup, you see a lot of, and just as an aspect of setup, particularly with higher handicappers or you know club golfers, just poor alignment, um, inability to, to to actually align a club to to the target point. So, which is a starting point of of, of the setup, really. And explain to me what you mean by neutral setup. Just you know, the first thing that we're looking to do is obviously align the golf club to um, to the to the target point. We're looking for the club face to be square to the to the target, both the setup and the strike position. And uh, you know, the second fundamental we like to see is to develop a um, a path where the club face is square to the path. So at the moment of impact, you know, for the club to be running down the target line. I mean, in, in reality, the the putter the putting stroke will have a slight arc to that stroke but through impact we're looking for the for the club to be running down the target line and club face square to the path now to help achieve those fundamentals when i talk about a neutral setup position you know we want you know our eyes in an optimum position which kind of run um down the ball to target line running parallel to that line and the body 
to be the, the alignment of the upper body to be neutral as well because that can influence the path of the stroke so when we talk about neutral we're talking about you know neutral body parts parallel alignment um uh, and good eye positioning those type of aspects I know that I've had uh, I, I had a revelation recently when I realized that my feet were not square um, to my target line. That I really was uh, my feet were really kind of angled, so the ball would, if I hit it dead straight, it would go just to the right of the hole, which was happening all the time. I was leading it just to the right, just to the right. Yeah. Um, well. I- these are certain things which, for some people, can be an idiosyncrasy. Um, you know, it's, it's trying to look at that individual and determine what's an idiosyncrasy and what's a fault. Because mm-hmm. um, people have different put, you know, putting styles, slightly different putting stances, etc. And I think it's, it becomes a fault when it doesn't function correctly. Um, you know, f- for everybody... Or for yourself, you know, you mentioned that you, it didn't function for you, but some people could put well with a slightly open stance or a slightly closed stance. And if re- if you look at it a little bit deeper, you know, the stance really doesn't affect uh, the path as much as the um, upper body alignment, the alignment of the shoulders or the alignment of the hips. So you could get away with maybe standing a little bit open or a little bit closed if, if that functioned for you. Oh, interesting. The shoulders and hips are more important than the feet position themselves. Yeah, I think the further up you get the body you get, the more important those that, that body parts alignment would be. And you probably want your lower half of your body very quiet during your putting stroke. Well, it's a, as a, ideally you're looking for the lower half to be relatively stable and then, you know, just pivoting the shoulders uh, around a fixed point. That's uh, but for some people that's not doesn't always sound that easy or is that easy but from an ideal perspective we're trying to create stability in the lower half and then pivot the shoulders very cleanly around that fixed point Hmm. interesting there's so much controversy between um on the putting stroke itself of a straight forward straight uh straight back straight forward versus an arc you mentioned the arc that it just needs to be square uh at the point of impact what's your feelings about that controversy and yeah, that, that conversation. I mean, like you said, we, we have a few fundamentals that we work on, and, and one of them is the fact that what we're looking for in the stroke is to keep the club face square to the path. Now, for some people, they might um, move the club on more of an arc than than the next person. If, that, if both people can keep the club face square to the path, then it means it's through impact. We're not going to put too much side spin on the ball. And so... And it, it depends on individual characteristics. It depends on that person's posture. Um, it depends on the plane that they rotate their shoulders on. There are a few individual characteristics that you take into account which will determine each person's path. From an ideal perspective, you, you don't want too much of an art, too great of an art, because in essence, the club would uh, appear to rotate too much. And if the club is rotating too much through the point of impact, then if you've got things like uh, variability in ball position or, or, or body movement, then the club is only square at one point through that excessive arc. And it can make it difficult to, to time where that square point is and obviously start the ball online. So, you know, we accept that the, the, the putty stroke will have an arc due to the fact that we stand to the side of the ball. You know, generally our shoulders will rotate a little bit. And um, but we're, we're, we're looking to, to try and minimize that arc so we don't have excessive rotation. And what about the position of your hands? I mean, I, I used to uh, be left hand low. And yep. now I more my hands are almost uh, at the same spot. Um, you know, they're parallel with one another. Some people like to go right hand low. Um, and some people do a claw grip. And, you know, there's so many different grips. Uh, what do you favor? I think um, I think left hand low has been, you know, has really helped a lot of people. And right hand low has obviously been the more conventional grip. And I think he, either can work for, for that individual um, or for any individual. One of the things that we like to see um, is that for the grip to be more in the palm of the hand. So, uh, you know, Harold has always termed it running down the lifeline. 
if if you grip the club as you would do in a full swing, or as most people would teach in the full swing, where it runs more across the fingers, then physiologically that becomes a very strong position to hold a club in. And if you think about it in a full swing, you hold it in the fingers because you want to increase the range of motion within that wrist. Now, if you grip the club in the fingers in the putting stroke and then we increase the range of motion and the wrists start to break, you can actually cause excessive rotation to the path. You know, and it's very easy for your hands to become involved. Um, I mean, even if the hands start to become involved, a small movement at the butt of the club actually produces quite a big movement at, at the at the end of the club. So even things like distance control can become more difficult uh, through that additional speed that can be added through through the hinging of the wrist. So... By trying to just, you know, eliminate some of that hand action um, through placing the club more in the palm, okay, so it's uh, harder for you to use your hands, then, um, you know, that would be something that we'd be looking for with to try and install as a principle with a lot of the golfers that we work with. Interesting, because for me, when I, I was using right hand low when I was first starting putting, um, I, I noticed that I was breaking my wrist a lot more. Um, that I was pushing it with my right hand, and so my wrist would break, and that if I kept my left hand low, um, I, I was able to keep my arm straight and the back of my hand towards the target a lot better. Yeah, and that's uh, something that you hear with a, a, a lot of students. So you know, whether you're left hand low or right hand low, whichever feels most comfortable and, more importantly, whichever functions best for the golfer, you know, that, that type of grip combined with, gripping through the palm or through the lifeline so the the shaft actually starts to look like an extension of the of your arm then um you know that those grips can work well and function well interesting i like the idea of uh through the lifeline of having the palm uh the the club going through the lifeline of your hand uh, that's really yeah i mean basically if you from a setup position looking down the ball to target line um, or if the golfer could stand uh, stand in front of a mirror and kind of put towards a mirror if the club is held through the lifeline then the club or the shaft should look to to form an extension of the forearm and that's always a nice kind of a uh, line or relationship that we like to see hmm. interesting um, well, now I'm, now I'm interested in asking you about putters because um, I personally have always liked a center shaft putter versus the shaft at the heel. Do you have a preference yeah. or do you see one being an advantage over another? I think the most important thing for the golfer is, is what they do. Um, I think there's a lot written about... Uh, putter types, you know, whether centre shaft or face balanced or heel toe heavy. Um, but the golfer really can overcome, uh, you know, most of most of, most of the problems that, that, that putting or most of the challenges that putting putting gives you through the application of good technique. The most important characteristics of the putter really are the length of the putter, so that the person set up in you know their ideal posture, the lie angle of the putter so that the club is, is, is fitted to, to, their, um, to their stance and, and style and, and the loft of the putter so that we're maximising you know, the, the student's ball roll. Um, putter style, well, you're looking for something that's going to have a reasonably sized sweet spot, but through good technique you can start to overcome all the other challenges really. So although there are lots of different styles out there, the most important thing I think to focus on is, is what you do as a, as a golfer. Yeah. Well, it's it's a nice approach to uh, hear somebody who's teaching to say, yeah, we got to work with what you have and and then make it work for you, as opposed to we got to break it down and start all over. Well, yeah, I think, uh, like you say, there are certain there are, there are four fundamentals we try and work on, which are always revolved around the. Uh, what's happened with the club face club face being square at set up and impact you know the club face being square to the path the fact that we want to try and get the ball rolling as opposed to jumping or skidding so that comes down to you know the golfer striking the ball with an upward blow but also with the correct amount of lofted impact and then the final fundamental is the fact that every putt's a straight putt 
Okay, um, it's the pace that you hit it that determines the, the break that it takes. So it's the importance of being able to control the speed of the club, and that comes down to not just technique but rhythm and tempo. So we're always looking for the golfer to try and establish those four fundamentals. And how we do it, well, you, you've got to look at how that golfer sets up and how that golfer moves. So you're looking at, you know, is the po- posture maximising what they do? Does the grip help them achieve those fundamentals? You know, does the, their stance and balance help them uh, achieve those fu- four fundamentals? So, you know, with some golfers, sometimes you have to break them down and build them back up again. With other other golfers, it's just a case of um, just give them a nudge in, in the right direction just to help them become a little bit more efficient. You mentioned that one of the fundamentals is, is the ball rolling, is coming off the club face and not jumping yeah. off. Um, now, that kind of gets us into sea groove technology, which Harold Swash uh, is known for correct he invented this idea harold did yeah Um, explain it to me please what does it mean well basically um through harold's like you say he's been harold's been around for a long time and and through his kind of research and um the various products he'd been involved with before harold really started to appreciate the importance of ball roll you know uh, the fact that if we could get the ball rolling you know, pretty much off the face of the putter, it's more likely to stay on its intended line. You know, if someone's uh, through the putter or the, their own stroke, creating a ball that's chipped into the earth and skids before it before it rolls, it can very easily be deflected offline, and it, and it it also makes distance control harder. So um, Harold, through various processes, came up with the idea of. Um, putting concentric grooves on the face of the putter and uh, he took this design to to yes golf which at the time was a company called pro gear and uh, the c groove putter was born really and then through all the independent testing that they did um you know uh, using high speed cameras it was clinically shown and proven that the the c groove putter could actually um get the ball rolling sooner than a lot of other its ma- major kind of competitors on the, on the market. And the advantage to the average golfer on getting that ball rolling is? Well, like I say, if you, if you can get the ball rolling, the sooner you can get the ball rolling, the more likely the ball is to stay on its intended line. And it will also help you in terms of consistency of um, uh, pace control, consistency of being able to judge the speed of the putt. And and so yes, putters right now are the only people that employ the C groove technology. C groove technology, yeah. I mean, there are other groove putters on the market. Yeah, um, yeah. C groove putter was probably, uh, I think, the the first real groove putter that um, received uh, you know kind of recognition in the marketplace. So obviously, on the back of that, there have been you know other uh, groove putters out. Seagroove would be the, the kind of leading groove uh, putter manufacturer at present. Yeah, because so many different putters uh, and manufacturers have putters with the face inserts and the soft inserts, and you know, there's no grooves at all. It's kind of, I don't know, just kind of a rough surface. Um, but but you feel that, um, and yes, putters feel that having the grooves really help keep the ball rolling purely. Yes. Yeah. Basically, I mean, uh, there's lots of different putters out there and lots of different philosophies, and I think it depends a lot on, on what your philosophy is. I know there are certain putter manufacturers that uh, if you went for a fitting with them, they'd be encouraging you to for the ball to jump and skid. But we try to look at things from a scientific viewpoint, you know, and try and understand, you know, what, what the effects of if a ball jumps and skids. Um, so... The, you know, the concept of ball roll is something that, yes, I've obviously, you know, uh, fundamentally behind. It's, it's part of our teaching philosophy. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we work on a lot. And, uh, you know, the sea groove certainly helps, will help the average golfer roll the ball that bit quicker. You know, lots of golfers through poor technique, okay, will uh, add lots of loft and, and the, as a result the ball will jump. Well, the grooves can help counteract that. I mean, there's nothing, there's, you know, like I said before, you know, with good technique, there's a lot that can be overcome. Um, but a lot of golfers are looking for that quick fix, aren't they? 
Yeah, and, of course. Um, you know, the, uh, certainly the, the groove component of the putter will help them produce a, a quicker and better ball roll. Wow. Interesting. Well, it's so neat to... Um to go to the yesgolf.com and look at the different styles. Was, I really enjoyed seeing the fact that uh, it's all about the grooves um, and there's so many different styles that will appeal to so many different types of golfers. I know that for me, like I said, I like a center shafted putter and I saw that you have a couple there um, that are interesting uh, in the way they look. And you, know, you also have the, uh, the belly and long putters as well. Yeah, there are lots of the you know, yes, I've built up quite a big, uh, substantial range now, and because um, a lot, you know, in terms of how a putter looks and feels, a lot of a- aesthetics involved. Like I mentioned, if you can get fitted correctly, and um, and you you make sure that the putter is set up in terms of the right length, loft, and lie, then a, a lot there's a lot to be said with then picking a putter which you like you like the look of which aesthetically you know looks pleasing to you so the good thing about the s range is that there are lots of different models so you can pick one that you um that you like and obviously for 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 other golfers looking at uh you know outside of conventional putting techniques you've got the long and, and the belly putters as well and i think for long or belly putters the sea groove really does work well because typically what you'll find is that um you know, guys using that style of putter will tend to add a lot more loft during the stroke, you know, mm. dynamic, dynamically. So if you've got, um, you know, the C groove working for you there, then obviously it's going to help in terms of the ball roll. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Very good. Phil, I wanted to ask you specifically, there's so many different types of putters that Yes Golf offers, but they've got a new one out called the Dawn Putter? Yes, that's uh, going to be out shortly, I believe. And why is that unique to everything else? Um, it's <clears throat> it's based upon one of the the more successful models that Yes have had out. That the the Yes Cali has been a particularly uh, popular model. Um, but the Dawn is is um, it's CNC milled, um, so it, it gives it a little bit more of a polished uh, uh, polished look and feel. And um, there are some slight uh, modifications to, in terms of aesthetics. Um, so it's that traditional um, answer style head that, you know, uh, was made popular way back uh, by Carson Solheim, which has lasted, uh, lasted its time. So um, it's that more traditional look, uh, CNC milled, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be, uh, you know, successful with uh, those yes lovers out there. All right. Uh, I have to ask you, it seems like when I'm looking through the, two, the new models, the blades, the mallets, all the different putters, they'll have women's names. Yes. Yeah. And what's that about? Do you want the official version or the unofficial version, Fred? Um, let's go unofficial. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's, there's only one true story. I mean, I, I always pull Harold's leg when people ask him that um, they're all named after Harold's lady friends. Oh. Um, which, so we have, a, we have a bit of a giggle there. But the, the true story is that um, I think uh, you know many years ago, uh, the, orig- the putters originally were just uh, you know, named after numbers as, you know, um, to identify them. And uh, at the time, what's now the Tracy model uh, was used being used by Retief Goosen and, and Retief um, won a US Open with it, which was obviously fantastic for, for Yes. Sure. And was great publicity. And I believe um, that allegedly Yes spoke to Retief about uh, trying to come together for some sort of endorsement, working together. Um, and they were going to call the putter the Goose. Now, for for whatever reason, I believe um, uh, his main manufacturing sponsor didn't want this to happen, mm. and so it, his contract then was changed so it wouldn't allow it. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, they were left in a position where they couldn't call the putter after Retief, so they called it after his um, wife, who's called Tracy. Oh. So that that was the starting point, really. You had Tracy, and then some of the later models were named after Harold's granddaughter. Emma, um, his daughter uh, Heather, and uh, more recently his great granddaughter, which is uh, who's called Abby. 
So um, they're all named after kind of women or ladies who are associated in some way uh, with people involved in the company. Well, thanks so much to uh, Harold Squash Putting. Dot co.uk. Pleasure. Thanks, Fred. 